Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 245, featuring the second installment of my interview with Mr. Robert Zerotech of Zerotech. This part of the interview, we focus in on the first Wizardry game. We talk about the design decisions, the copy protection, uh, the export, exporting it to uh, Japan, and much, much more. A lot of great stuff in this episode, so without further ado, here is Mr. Robert Zerotech. So is it true that uh, I guess it was to be Robert Woodhead originally wanted to call this game Dungeons of Despair, and Gary Gygax heard about it and thought it was a little too similar to Dungeons and Dragons, and no, not quite <laughs> that right. led to a name change. Or is this? Yeah, no, no. This this, this was this, uh, is this, uh, this, this not was quite uh, right. an in-house beta name that we gave the product. Uh, we displayed. We actually we actually this product was in development for a long time. Uh, it started in late seven, 1979 and uh and so it was under development for a couple of years it went it started as a basic program and then we converted it to UCSD Pascal code and the beauty for that was the portability from one platform to another which served us well when the IBM PC came out and then the PC Junior and all that so we were able to port from platform to platform very quickly change right we were we were putting the product uh, out for the first time uh, in Boston at the Apple Fest that was being held in Apple in Boston, um, 1981, April of 1981, and uh, that was just an in-house name that we were using for that for that event, and we were actually selling a product, and uh, we wanted to field test it to make sure that it had some integrity before launching it in September, and so we sold. Five or six hundred copies or something uh, really went very well. We found all kinds of bugs with it, uh, fixed those bugs. So when we had it finally released properly in September, it went very well. There were no bugs. Everybody was thrilled with it. Uh, a couple of minor incidents, but nothing too serious. And uh, it was important to us to make sure that the product had full integrity when it was launched in September of '81. Richard, Perkett. wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if more modern companies had that wouldn't attitude? It be great? <laughs> I don't know. We were very conscientious about it. Richard Garriott came to market. I, with really? His, yeah, he was with. Uh, he did his Acrobat through California and Pacific, and and he came to market. Uh, what three four months before us? So he actually has bragging rights for being the first CRPG. Oh, I thought you were going to say he was one of the guys who bought one of the copies of. What a bought copy? Oh, probably game. did. We ought to ask him. He's probably, probably inspired him in some way as well. <laughs> uh, so I guess Gary Gygax, or was he there too? Or how did the... Did somebody say this sounds too much like Dungeons and Dragons? We need to change the name to... Well, we were never going to oh, use it. Why not? No, Wizardry. We were never going to use that name. <laughs> it was actually called Wizardry Dungeons of Despair. Oh, so I it was see. a subname, a subtitle. Um, but we did get... Uh, a letter from Gary Gygax's company. No disrespect to Gary. His lawyers had done this, and they they thought that we were violating uh, copyright. So we asked them to explain how exactly were we doing that, and we never heard back from them. So that was that. Yeah, that when I read about this, I got a little worried because I have a, a book called Dungeons and Desktops. Oh. <laughs> You know, I thought if this were, you know, if this were true, then I might be getting a letter soon. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I, I think it'll be fine. Uh, okay, so how did it become a Proving Grounds of the Mad Overlord? This is a really cool name. Well, the Overlord is the Mad Overlord in the bottom of the dungeon. Uh, so it really was just a uh, keying in on the on the heavyweight down there and titling it after after that bad guy. So you said he originally programmed it in BASIC, and then you guys converted it to Pascal. Uh, but there, I was reading about some sort of memory issues with the Apple II at the time, or there was something 
some kind of limitation on the memory, I guess, and you had to wait a while to release it? Um, I don't remember that. Uh, that could have been an issue, one of the many issues we had to deal with. I know that when we um, released that beta version in April of 1981, one of the problems um, that we found that was played a lot of havoc on us, uh, there were flags that you trip on and off in order to make the program work the way we wanted it to work. And one of the flags was tripped off when it should have been on, which caused the, the 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 puzzle that you had to solve in order to advance further in the game to be circular. So there was no solution to the puzzle, so therefore you couldn't advance. So we would not have known that had it not been for this beta, so that was really good. We fixed it, of course, and we made everybody happy that had these early products. And one of the things that happened is we didn't have any cop protection on these products, so uh, it was being copied and pirated everywhere. It was buggy, and it was playable, but not very enjoyably. And in the end, all of the ripped-off pirated copies that were floating around the industry really helped us market this product. I mean, it gave us a lot of, a lot of airplay. And uh, it may have been that way that Gary Gygax's company got a hold of it and uh, started ripping into it and said, hmm. We found we found this pirated copy of your game, and now we want to. Yeah, we're gonna protect our turf. Huh? You know how lawyers can be, huh? Oh yeah. One of the things I love about wizardry is that instead of just having one character that's sort of given to you, actually get to create your own your own party. Uh, so was that? I guess that was in the original designs all oh, along, yeah. and. How conscious were you? Was it say we need? Well, we need to be different than this Ultima uh, series. Is there any anything like that going on? Or was it was this? Well, just the well, uh, original with idea? Richard's product, we hadn't even seen it, hadn't heard of it. Uh, we we didn't really know what Richard was doing. We were in upstate New York, pretty isolated. Hadn't attended any shows until the first Apple, Apple Fest in Boston, April of 1981, apart from this Trenton Users Group show that we mentioned earlier. Uh, but there were like five companies or ten companies or something at this Users Group show. It was very low-key. It wasn't as national. Uh, it didn't have the national spotlight on it like the Apple Fest did in Boston. And it was not until Boston, I think, that we met some of the industry players. Doug Carlson, Ken Williams of Sierra Online. Um, I, I don't remember if Richard was there. Um, probably. I mean, anybody that was anybody was at this show. So when Richard's product came to market, I don't even know that we bought a copy initially um, because we were so close to launching our own. We had our hands full, Matt. So uh, we just basically finished up our product and, and got the bugs out of it. It was designed, the, the multi-character uh, concept was does, designed in this product from get-go. So it, it, that was not going to change. It was part of the core system architecture of the game. Was the idea that multiple people would play it together on the same computer or that just one person would control all the characters? Oh, it was mainly one person that would control all the characters, but we had lots of people uh, getting their friends together and they would each control their own character. That kind of was an early advent of the multi uh, multiplayer thing, huh? But... Yeah, we tried that a few times uh, back in the day and it would always get a little chaotic with, oh, I, you know, I told you to press <laughs> this button, you know, because... <laughs> Eventually, the guy at the keyboard would just get frustrated with that. Yeah, but, you know, there's yeah. an interesting tidbit with this. Uh, back when the product was released in 81, you know, the Apple was only on the street for about two years or something. Uh, and it was mainly a business computer because it was so expensive. Uh, many of the bosses that bought this computer for their secretaries found that their secretaries would go, ah, oh, computer, if I press the wrong button, and so I'm going to delete something. They were really paranoid about it. So, you know, the, the people that own these computers uh, and the companies uh, tapped into video games really to get their secretaries and others that worked with these computers comfortable with it. So we found our products being played 
in the office environment to get people used to playing around with computers. Later, uh, we also found that there were uh, there was a psychiatrist who worked with troubled children, and uh, and he would use our product to and put it uh, to get these kids to play the, our product, and and they would uh, uh, open up to the child psychiatrist over their feelings about what they learned. They just got more comfortable with the doctor because he was now being considered a cool guy. Blah blah blah. There there were all kinds of applications like this. Uh, that were put to use. Also, the product uh, somewhere in in Pennsylvania, one of the universities of Pennsylvania, our product in the mid '80s was being used to teach logic, and probably one of the precursors to game design that's now being taught at many universities around the country. So uh, these aspects, of course, these were fringe benefits uh, from from launching product into a market like consumer market like this. I mean, we we built this game to have fun. That that's let's let's be real. This was a video game. We were out there to make fantastic entertainment for people to enjoy, and that's what we did. But we had all these other little things going on that made a whole, a whole lot interesting. Yeah, I can't tell you how many the game developers and designers I've had on this show and they cite wizardry, you know, as the game that got them interested in making yeah. games. So it's definitely I mean it I, I can't even calculate the the influence it's had. Who knew, you know? All I wanted when I first got into this business was a car. That's all I really wanted. <laughs> and what do you ever get do you ever get the you car? Got the car plus stuff. But it you know you're talking about things that brought a lot of wholesome experiences to this venture. It really was a wonderful trip. We got to see the world. We got to set up. Uh, we were one of the first companies, for example, to localize product uh, for, Japan, for Japan, for sales in Japan. And we got to know, you know Japanese customs, how things went on in the mid-'80s there, um, Malaysia, Hong Kong, all these areas we we wanted to uh, uh, put our products in uh, there and, and create sales. And it became a very important market segment for us. So it was great, great experience. Loved it. I'm getting a little out of order with my questions yeah. here, but since you brought up this, this, this Japanese thing has, has really, I've always been really curious about that. So, so how did this, they, uh, you went and showed them wizardry, I guess, and they, uh, some companies bought it and started developing their own wizardries. I mean, how, how did this work out? Yeah, sorry, Matt. I don't mean to be jumping ahead. I tend to jump around. Oh no, no, no! <laughs> it just uh, just happens to be the order oh, of my that, questions. That's great. So, I, I, if you see me shuffling pages uh, okay. a lot, that's, yep, yeah, you'll yep. know what's going. All on. right. So, um, in 1982, we were approached by a company called Starcraft. It was based in Japan. Starcraft. Starcraft yeah. He. Uh, this was a very early Japanese computer company. Um, obviously. They they basically bought American-made video games and imported it to Japan, and and sold them. It was a small company, a very small market at the time, though. And uh, uh, he sold enough copies uh, that in time, when the market started to enlarge, larger players started getting involved. We were approached by ASCII Corporation. They're the guys that worked with Bill Gates uh, to uh, create MSX. That was an operating system in its day. And they, uh, and uh, Nishi, I think was the guy's name, I don't remember it completely now, Nishi something, um, was the president of ASCII Corporation, worked very closely with Bill Gates in the early days of Microsoft. Uh, he had this company and he, he wanted our products. So he sent uh, three or four of his people over to meet with us. We cut a deal. And that deal basically called for localizing uh, the products into J Japanese, uh, into katakana and kanji and all the other dialects that they had there. And uh, that's when we uh, resold our products through ASCII. It was a break from StarCraft. 
StarCraft wasn't large enough to really handle the kind of ambitions that we had at that time. So we went with ASCII, and th they are the ones that actually developed the market in Japan for us. And then shortly after, you had a battery of American companies come in behind us, including Richard with his Ultima series. But uh, they were playing catch up, and we were already light years ahead. <laughs> right. So really, you, you were the first company in Japan with Plus, the, yeah. these role by, by a long shot, by a couple of years, easy, maybe three years or so. And then they, some, I guess some of the companies were inspired by Wizardry and went out and did their own very similar games. that ever bother you? Not really. Uh, it's, you know, it's flattering to be imitated, I suppose. We just don't want the imitations to be that close. Uh, and they weren't. Um, I know that fantasy, the fantasy series, uh, was inspired by our products. Um, uh, you know, and, and it's it's all a matter of just building great product. If if we inspired somebody to go out there and create something different that was incredibly entertaining, all the more power to you. Isn't that what it's all about? That's that's it, the world is a great place. It's full of different variables, and if you know, it needs to be reflected in 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 the industry in which we played. So, yeah. So I noticed that the Wizardry series is still going on in Japan. I mean, I noticed a couple of games that I don't even know what the names are. I see Wizardry and then some characters <laughs> after the name. So uh, do you know anything about you know these, these uh, Japanese games? I guess they control the IP. Uh, well, they control the IP uh, to all Wizardries except Wizardry 1 to 5. We, we have those. Um, so... Uh, I don't know what they're doing with it. Uh, they also have the trademark. So they're, they're selling products over there um, that are derivatives of the stuff that they have rights to, or they're creating their own things. I know there's a massive multiplayer game going on right now called Wizardry Online. Um, we have nothing to do with that. So that's... So I guess there's not much hope of a Wizardry 9, then. Well, I'll never say never. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, so back to Wizardry 1. Uh, just a kind of an odd question, perhaps, but I was thinking about the spell system and how you had to type in Duma Pick and so on. Uh, was that uh, spell system designed in any way to as a copy protection measure? since you would have to know these codes to play the game, and the only way you'd know the codes is if you had the manual? Um, it may have been. I know that... Um, remind me, Matt, did you did you have to type this stuff in to get the game engaged? Is that right? Yeah, I can, I can still remember a couple of the, <laughs> the codes. I think Duma Pick was the one to look at a map. But, you know, I played the game for years. You know, I had the old pirated copy like... Yeah. Uh, you know, you're talking about. So I just was never able to cast any spells. And finally, when I got the cop actual copy of the game, suddenly <laughs> you know, I, could, I had the manual so I could input all the all the spells. And you know, I thought, well, this is a pretty clever way to get you to buy a copy because most of the pirated copies would just be the, the disc. You wouldn't have these uh, the spells. So there were a number. Of, if we okay, if we're talking about copy protection, I'll kind of cycle you through all of it. Uh, when we started in this, we, we act, when, when Galactic Tab was released, there was a copy protection program that Robert Wood had actually created. It was an amazing piece of work. Um, it really were, was early days for copy protection. It was a very controversial thing uh, to start with, with the culture, the open culture in the computer industry and now having to copy protect your products. It just seemed completely against any all of the philosophies of what computing was about in its day. So we grappled with that. And um, at the end of the day, we just, for, for our own financial health and welfare, we needed to do something because we are getting so many products ripped off. We won't survive if we don't make enough money to continue. So we had to do this. Anyway, copper protection was a software solution for Galactic Attack, which we then modified and applied to Wizardry. That worked well for a number of years. We may have gone to this 
system that you're talking about where you enter a spell name in order to unlock the game. That may have been after we decided that the soft protection wasn't the, the best way from one platform to another. Since we had such portability, it created havoc going from one platform to another. We may have dumped the software copy protection schemes in favor of what you're talking about. And then I know uh, at some point we also went through this copy proof paper. Is a return of word? I think so, yeah. <clears throat> the Mordor charge card? <laughs> well, that was just kind of an add on there. Um, I don't know where the Mordor charge card came from. That was Robert's idea. And why not to, to add some spice to the packaging contents? So we did that. But there was also a booklet, a multi page uh, booklet that, uh, that was kind of maroon in color with a very dark print. You could see it well enough to know when asked to enter, you know, the 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 information in cell A5, you would enter it in the computer and, and the and the program would work. But try copying that and passing it on to your friends, it wouldn't work. And it was one of the very first uh, methods of non copy protection paper out there. And I know that caught the industry, uh, it caught, caught people's attention in the industry. <laughs> I was kind of. Did, did you guys get? Did you guys get a lot of hate mail? No, over actually, it was, it was people... a pretty good solution. You know, it, it it provided people to play the game in a in a without worrying about the copy protection worrying or not, right? And and it gave us the protection that we needed for some financial integrity for going forward. We got paid for what we what we built, you know. So it was a good solution, I think. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with part three of my interview with uh, Robert Zero Tech. And believe me, things are about to get quite controversial. So you definitely want to stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much, guys. If you have supported my show here, Matt Chat, if you would like to support the show, just go to the link in the show notes to the Patreon site. That will also get you uh, access to the uh, monthly Google Air Hangouts and a special uh, Patreon supporters only podcast. Just about to do another one of those, so uh, stay tuned. Uh, let's see, news from the Matt Cave. Uh, biggest piece of news uh, that I have for you is really two things. Uh, one is that over go uh, GOG, goodoldgames.com, GOG.com, they're having a huge summer sale, uh, stuff 90% off. Uh, I have an affiliate link with them that I'll share with you. Uh, but you definitely want to head over there, keep an eye on that. They've been having some really excellent uh, classics available. Just picked up the whole Tex Murphy series, I think, for uh, five or six bucks. And a bunch of new stuff coming out every day. So stay tuned or, you know, head on over there and see what's, see what's up there. I'm almost positive you'll see something you like. Uh, on June 19th, apparently Steam uh, is having a big sale, I guess maybe to compete with the GOG people or... Or what? I don't. I don't have any information yet on what's going on sale, but apparently it's a big deal. Uh, so you might want to, you know, be around a PC on June 19th. Uh, also, a little trick with Steam: if you put things on your wish list, uh, you'll get notified if uh, if it goes on sale. So I've actually picked up quite a few games uh, that way. Uh, another piece of news: uh, Frayed Knights. Remember I interviewed Jay Barnson. I guess it's probably been a couple years ago. Anyway, he finally got that Frayed Knights game on the uh, Steam Greenlight uh, community. Uh, so that's exciting for him. Hopefully that will uh, get us, uh, means that we'll have Frayed Knights 2 even sooner. All right, whew, quite a bit of news. Uh, and then just some other fun stuff. Uh, Paul Poussin, or perhaps Poussin, uh, sent me this game. This is uh, Jutland, or Jutland. This apparently is a relatively obscure war game by Software Sorcery 1993. I uh, hadn't got a chance to play this, but he thought it was really cool and wanted to send it on. So maybe we'll, you know, who knows, I'll see if I can get this installed and maybe show it to you next time. Uh, and then also, this is really cool, uh, Neil Halford and Jana Halford uh, sent me a copy of Swords and Circuitry, a beginner's guide to computer role-playing games. And they, you know, they really went all out here. They both signed it and wrote little messages to me. Uh, here's what Neil wrote to Matt. The greatest archivist in the digital dungeon. Thanks for all the well wishes and support. And then Jana wrote, always make sure the, well, maybe this is all Neil. <laughs> I can't tell whose handwriting uh, this is. Always make sure they send you galleys so you can spell check your name. <laughs> oh my God, really? Oh, they misspelled uh, their last names on the, the book here. That's very sad. They got it right on the cover 
have a knot on it, not on the inside. So that's that's pretty terrible. But uh, anyway, thanks uh, uh, to uh, Neil and Jennifer sending me this lovely, lovely book. Nice. No, it's a lot thicker than I imagined it would be. So anyway, really looking forward to uh, looking at this one. All right, let's wrap this up uh, with an ale. Wait, I'm getting all mixed up here. Uh, what about that ale of the week? Uh, okay, this week I've got a, another selection from the Stone Brewing Company. Uh, this is the Stone Saison, ale brewed with spices. And they've got a write up on the back. Apparently, Stone has a chain of restaurants now. I guess they grow a lot of their own vegetables and herbs. Uh, some kind of bistro and gardens restaurant. So anyway, they, I guess they have all the stuff growing in their garden, so they decided to stick it in the ale. Let's see. So it's supposed to have thyme, lavender. Oh, wait, lemon thyme or lemon and thyme? I... <laughs> is there such a thing as lemon thyme? Or is that supposed to be lemon comma thyme? But anyway, uh, let's see. Lemon zest. Let's see if they say anything here about the alcohol content. 6%. So, not bad. Shouldn't be too uh, too strong. Uh, let's see. Paired with... Paired with... Uh, <laughs> I think they left it off what it was supposed to be paired with. Anyway, who cares? Uh, let's get this uh, Stone Saison open and see what it's all about. Ah. Whew, that's some good smelling beer right there. Uh, you can definitely smell that sort of citrusy, lemony stuff they were talking about. Maybe even a bit of the lavender. It just smells uh, really extraordinary. I think this is probably the the best smelling ale I've uh, <laughs> smelled in quite a while. Really nice aroma on this. You almost want to dab a little bit behind the ears, you know. Anyway, let's give it a taste. Mm. I definitely taste that lemon zest. Very uh, acidic. A little bit of a lemon rind like uh, quality to that. Uh, a little bitter, not not too overpowering. Uh, definitely some bitterness here though. A bit of that Belgian flavor, a little bit of peach. Let me try it again. Definitely tasting some interesting uh, flavors here with the herbs. I guess that must be some of that uh, thyme they were talking about. And as we'd say down south, there's a bit of a wang to this. Uh, it's kind of exotic flavor. It's really hard to describe this. Let me try it one more time. And overall, not bad. You definitely taste that lemon zest. The lemon is really strong. Uh, you can taste a little bit of stuff going on there with the herbs, maybe the lavender and uh, thyme. Uh, a little bit of a Belgian flavor. Uh, you wouldn't mistake this for a traditional Belgian ale, though, by, by any means. Um, Overall, not bad. I'm not going to say it's the best beer I've ever had or anything, uh, but it's definitely not bad. I'm going to go with, uh, I'm sort of torn between a three and a four. I guess we'll go for a full four out of five uh, drinking horns on this. I really tasty, definitely something different. Uh, they might have overdid it a little bit with the lemon, but uh, overall, not, not a bad ale. Uh, okay, anyway, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking for quotations about pirates, and I came across one uh, by Errol Flynn. And anyway, I was looking at some of his uh, quotes, and I, I really like this one. And even though it has nothing to do with uh, pirates, I thought it would be a good choice anyway. Just a great quote. Anyway, here it goes. Any man who has $10,000 left when he dies is a failure. <laughs> See you guys next week. This little darling is a Commodore Amiga with a Motorola 6800 chipset using a homemade operating system. I got it from the computer exhibit on the third floor. I used to have this exact computer. My geek princess. Mm -hmm. I knew the mall couldn't suck out your soul.